Вече се, да. В вас по телефона гледам. Добре дошли на всички. Няколко думи на български и след това ще минаваме на английски. Благодаря, че сте дошли. Ние сме много горди, че имаме като гост професор Брукс, един от най-важни специалисти по дигитална палеография. И не искам да вземам прекалено време. Дам веднага дума на Констанца, която ще води днес на английски семинар. Um, yeah, so thank you, Marco. Um, I just wanted to briefly introduce our speaker today, whose paper is entitled Computer Assisted Paleography What, Why, and When. Um, in rehearsing this, I always miss, um, misplace the questions, but anyway, it's what, why, and when. Um, Professor Brooks is a Lyle Fellow in Latin Paleography um, at the Bodian Library in Oxford, as well as a um, Fellow at Lincoln College. Um, before his experience uh, and adventures in Oxford, he was based um, in London, he's still based in London, I think, uh, where he took his PhD degree at King's College and um, uh, continued um, in the area by teaching uh, medieval literature. Indeed, his research interests range from uh, the transmission of biblical text in the uh, medieval period to uh, old and middle English uh, literature. Um, he's done extensive work on Afric of Ansham. Um, and besides this, he has been uh, coordinating um, the uh, archetype project. And so um, kind of developing further his interest for uh, paleography um, and digital humanities, so the employment of um, computer assisted tools for the analysis of uh, digitized material. Besides Latin paleography, he's also interested in Hebrew uh, manuscripts and that's uh, quite fitting for our case because of course, um, our um, interest as the project of the Copisti um, 14, so the, the scribes and scriptorial and uh, the Balkan area. You're working uh, we, entirely with Hebrew manuscripts, that's amazing. Okay, that's no true, <laughs> but we definitely work with a script different than Latin. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe there will be some parallels there, um, but maybe also in the future with some of manuscripts. Um, so I should leave the floor to Professor Brooks. And before that, um, just to make sure that everyone has their microphones off. If there are questions that you want to ask, please uh, write them in the chat. And otherwise we will reconvene at the end. And yeah, ask all the questions we have. Fantastic. All right, good afternoon. Thank you to so many of you for, for showing up. You're gonna get like a, a whistle-stop tour of me talking about artificial intelligence and image segmentation and stuff. I know you've had papers about that before. I want us to think about what I do, which is computer assisted paleography, which is maybe a slightly different thing. And I want to talk about what that is. All right, let me get my presentation up and we'll get going. Okay. Let's see if I can share the correct thing. Where is it? Santa, can you see that on your screen? Does it say computer assisted paleography? It does indeed. Amazing. Okay, so in the corpora I work with, there have been a lot of funding. I know it's been different for your uh, for your manuscripts, your corpus, a lot of manuscripts, but there's been huge funding has come in through the Polonsky Foundation, for instance, and at the Bodleian Library, at the Vatican Library, they digitized absolutely everything. Right, that was one of the conditions of the funding bid, you know, I don't know, like one of my favorite manuscripts is the Lindus van Gospels, like eight centuries, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the treasures of the British Library. If you speak to the British Library, they'll say, it's one of the masterpieces of human civilization, you know, and you know, that's something where money goes in, you know, it's shiny, it has lots of beautiful um, gospel manuscript illustrations, evangelist portraits, a lot of money goes in. The kind of thing that doesn't normally get digitized are things like this, which is a 15th century uh, biblical commentary in Hebrew with a cursive 
15th century script, no pictures, nothing pretty about it. Um, there are other copies of it. There's nothing super special about this, apart from it exists, right? I'm interested in the script. I want to see how this looks different in the 15th century to the 16th century or the 14th century copies. Um, but this is the kind of thing that doesn't get digitized normally because it doesn't, it's not attractive to the general public, if you like. It's not pretty, right? It's, it's a thing. And that's one of the challenges is saying, you know, how you persuade uh, manuscripts to digitize things to, to make them available. All right, so um, this manuscript's available online. We can bring in like other comparable manuscripts and typ typical scripts in IIIF and put them side by side with each other and begin to compare the handwriting, the style, the layout, and presentation. Here's a, a nice example. It's the opening to the Canterbury Tales. And we can begin to see like you know, the different thing, like the letter W here over here, you know, one that April, the differences in the script. You see like elongated ascenders up here. Uh, this one's much more decorative, right? We can see that straight away. And that's a kind of new technology thing we can do is to bring them into our triple AF video, uh, viewer and put them next to each other and begin to see them and compare them. You know, what are the openings? What are the set pieces? You know, I work a lot with gospel manuscripts in Latin. So, you know, we say, you know, let's see what the evangelist portraits look like. Let's see how the, you know, whether they've got captions. You know, Linda's fine gospels, everything's captioned. It says, you know, this is a picture of John. You know, it's not just the evangelist symbol and saying, you know, there it is, like the wing ball. You know, it, it's Luke, sorry, the wing ball is Luke. Um, it will say actually what it is, it goes through. And not every gospel manuscript from early medieval England will do that or Ireland. All right, so hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts have been, Hebrew manuscripts have been digitized um, in the, by the Polonsky Foundation at the, at the uh, British Library, at the Bodleian Library, at the Vatican. We've got extraordinary access to material. And, you know, one of our questions, you know, when I began working on different digital tools was what takes us beyond turning the pages? You know, what can we do beyond that? You know, as I said the other day in a paper at Oxford, there are millions and millions and millions of images. I don't want you to get too jealous there if your corpus hasn't been digitized, but there are so, there's so much digitized that, you know, we're not sure what to look at. You know, and I think it's as exciting in terms of access to Latin, Hebrew, uh, Greek manuscripts a moment as the moment when the printing press was invented, in that we've got access to a level of knowledge that we never had before. We don't have to say, I'm gonna go and look at the 15th century copy of, you know, this Yehuda manuscript or whatever. I'm gonna to go to, I have to go to the Bodleian. I have to sit there, I can view it online. I can begin to do that research and do compar comparative research and particularly on scripts that were not available before. As I said, like the deluxe manuscripts got digitized. They were where the focus was, not on the kind of everyday, you know, we need the text, we need to, to read it. Here's a pretty manuscript though from the British Library, just for fun. I'll give you a, a few seconds to look at some nice extended ascenders on the Lamed here in gold, it's quite nice. Right? Fifteenth century Lisbon. Constanta, I think you said one of the aims of this talk was to make sure that everyone was fluent in uh, 15th century Hebrew script by the end of the by the end of the 40 minutes. So um, you know we've made a, a good. I don't know if do you want to it's, you know amongst friends do you want to start reading this for us? Oh, later at the end. Okay, you can read it at the end. Okay, fine. If only okay. I could identify at least one letter. It's all good fun, but this is an example. This is an example of something that, you know, is a priority to have digitized. Um, this is an example that's very low down the list, right? It's only because the Polonsky Foundation put all their money into digitizing the whole collections that we get something like this digitized if we see that, we see that point. All right, there are different approaches to like machine learning, um, you know, um, artificial intelligence um, that are around. One of them is, to transcribe the text. Now I'm gonna make a point that, you know, in terms of paleography, do we want a machine to automatically transcribe it and read it for us? How does that support our research? We may do, right, we may do. Um, so Transcribus is one of these. So as you may know, you download the app, use it for free. It segments the lines like this. So it chops them up. Where does the line end? Where does it begin? And then what you do is you train it, you type in, about a hundred pages, in this case, a hundred pages of Hebrew. It compares what you've typed here to what it sees here, and then it learns something. So, you know, if I put Greek into this instead of Hebrew, I've got to train it again, unless someone else has done it. 
um, if I put in consenta, like what language am I going to put in here? Choose a language for me. Choose Slavonic. Okay, I put Slavonic in. I'm going to have to train it again, right, every single time. So it will always do the segmentation. It will always work that out. But you have to end, you know, it's roughly 100 pages of transcription, and then it starts to be sort of 70, 80, sometimes 90% accurate in what it does. Okay, that's impressive. Um, if you want some the computer to transcribe the text for you. Okay, the question is, is that a paleography question? Is that one of our aims? It might be, right? But there it is. Here's a, another system by um, Peter Stokes and uh, a number of other people, which is called eScriptorium. Again, it does a similar thing. It transcribes the text, does Hebrew, does Arabic, does Latin, does Greek. Uh, you know, it segments it first of all, and then it transcribes it. That's like a rival system. There's my colleague Peter Stokes working on that. Um, what the British Library did was they digitized all of their Hebrew manuscripts through Polonsky uh, money and then put them in folders. And you can just, you don't turn the pages, you can just grab all the images. They've got a turning the pages viewer as well, but you can just grab all the images and start to run artificial intelligence stuff over it. That's pretty transformative because you're not going to a web page and downloading an image. You've got folders and folders of, of things you can um, you can work with. I think there's 800,000 images of Hebrew manuscripts at the moment. You can just download all of them, just like that on your computer. Um, and the kind of thing that allows you to do, like say you were interested in images of dragons, you can drop all of your 800,000 images in and say to your piece of AI software, find me images of dragons. Don't want this page not interesting, right? That's going to take me many months to go through 800,000 images, depending on how long I spend each day, right? But looking if I was interested in research for dragons, I want the computer to find it for me. So I was speaking to some colleagues the other day and they said, well, we can find you something that's kind of dragon-like if you want, right? Uh, we can't read the script, but we also can't tell like what really makes it a dragon. Is that a dragon or is it a duck? Which one is which? Like, the computer doesn't quite get that yet, right? So we have to like train it. Um, <laughs> they, they may be kind of very similar. Okay, so how can it find it? Um, you know, but that's again, a more difficult, test case. If I wanted it to identify a particular script, that's again more, more of a challenge. In terms of segmenting, you know, finding where does the text begin, where does it end, this again is a bit more difficult because the, the text here is inside the dragon's tail. That might confuse our transcription software. But here's a, a group at, of computer scientists at Oxford who are working on this kind of thing. You can download their software for free, drop your images in, or your, you know, your images of text and see how it seg segments it, what, what it can find and what it can't find. And then we end up with something like this. This is the um, Golden Haggadah, which is early 14th century from um, Al-Andalus from Spain. Uh, the thing it can do is it can chop that up into four images, right? It can say, you know, if it's very clever, it works out it's a Hebrew manuscript and that it goes from right to left. Just like Hebrew script obviously goes from right to left, so the images go from right to left. Um, it can segment it, but what it can't do is tell us what that is. Right? We'll look at that and said, that's clearly Joseph's dream. Anyone who knows the biblical story, it's Joseph's dream or Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical. It's um, you know, it's the sheaves of wheat bowing down to his wheat. You know, this is Jacob wrestling with Esau's angel, right? The computer's not going to do that. If we're lucky, we'll find the image. If we're super lucky, it will segment it from that panel we saw at the beginning. But there they are. Right, we'll work out it's a different thing, we'll present it to me, but it can't do more than that. And this is like a, a super huge challenge because we've got text and image and it's like less clear boundaries. You know, it can, that's the kind of image it can get. This one's more of a challenge, right? Depends on the software. And it might trip up over, you know, where does that begin? Um, but that's, you know, if I want images of, um, you know, Book of Genesis, um, Abraham, about to sacrifice his son Isaac, right? I want to drop in my 800,000 images of Hebrew manuscripts at the British Library and say, find them for me. We're not quite there yet. We're beginning to be there, right? And we'll get a lot of false matches when we start to like do, do searches. Okay. So I wanted to begin there and say, you know, that's our start. You know, that's two of the things computers allow you to do, transcribe text and chop it up and try and find the difference between text and images. They might help us if we've got, as I said, thousands of images of things. Um, but let's get back to what paleography is, right? Paleography is four questions, as we know. What was written? When was it written? It's very exciting, this, isn't it? Where was it written? And by whom? 
Right, so what was written? When was it written? Where was it written? And by whom? Okay, okay with that so far. Um, let's imagine we had a black box. Let's think what it is. Um, it can be this. Imagine this is a very compu clever computer. I can take my image, do text. I can feed it through there, and it can spit it out the other side. And it can say to me, I can tell you roughly when it was written, where it was written, when it was written, and by whom. Okay. It can't do that, right? But let's imagine it could. I could feed everything into this computer technology here, also known as codex. Um, I could feed it into there. The question is, what would that allow us to do? That was, that's really only the beginning of our work, right? Like our aim as, as paleographers is not just to read the text or say when, when it was written, where it was written and by whom, it's to analyze that data and go beyond it. But we're nowhere near that with a computer. It can't do these things. We still have to do uh, those. The most it can do maybe is do what was it written? What was written? If we put a lot of energy into creating, creating that. All right, so David Gantz says the problem with paleography is that paleographers are all too often regarded as repositories of authoritative dogma. In other words, you pr present them a, doc a document and they tell you, you know, those things like when was it written? You know, who wrote it? Um, Albert Derrile says paleography is an authoritarian discipline, the pertinence of which depends on the authority of the author and the faith of the reader. So we see this here as a traditional Latin paleographer at work. Um, you give them a document and they look at it, right? And they say, oh yes, it's written at 1016 in Worcester. It's a place in England. And you say to them, how do you know it's written at 1016 in Worcester? And the person says, well, because I've been studying Worcester script for 40 years. Okay, that doesn't necessarily help us. And we have to trust that, that, that person. Um, here's an example of this in action from the TV series, Last Kingdom, anyone who's been watching that? Oh, that's Irish work. So there we are. It looks Irish. like it's 1016 Worcester. It looks like it's an old Slavonic script from whatever date, you know. Um, Albert Derrile like, continuously says, when an extremely experienced paleographer declares a given manuscript was written in Northern France in the first half of the 13th century, but fails to indicate the criteria on which the statement is based, he may be a perfect connoisseur, but he's not being an effective teacher. And this is like, like at the heart of like much of what I do, which is to try and create, create tools for teaching, right? What is more, he unconsciously contributes to the present day crisis of paleography as a di discipline. Uh, we know there are many crises in the world right now, sadly. Um, the one we have paid insufficient attention to is the crisis in, in paleography. You know, if I show you these images, Constanta, who's that? Come on. Like that on the spot? Yes, on the spot. Who is that? <laughs> Beethoven. Beethoven, okay, who's that? Composers, Mozart and yeah, that's Bach. Okay, good. Constanta, come on, you have to come back. Who's that? Uh, um, David Amazing. Okay, David Bowie. So we've got the three great musical composers of all time. We'll begin with B, coincidentally. Beethoven, Bach, and Bowie. Um, without having a PhD in musicology or fashion design, I suspect you can tell us that this dude here, David Bowie, is from a different period to these guys, right? We just kind of know that, right? If you're very good, you'll be able to tell us the period of David Bowie. Right? You'll look at that and say, okay, fine. We've all had long hair like that. Mine grew back. Um, you know, and, you know, there we are. You'd better say which decade we're from, because I know my David Bowie stuff, right? Um, you just know it, like, you know, and um, so why can't we look at that and say, oh, yes, definitely 11th century, English vernacular minuscule, right? Um, and in the border, we've got a gloss, also obviously English vernacular minuscule, and slightly later in the 11th century, probably 30 or 40 years later, with those paleographers we don't really feel comfortable dating, uh, you know, within a hundred year boundary maybe, but you know, 11th century, 11th century, and this one here, oh look, it's, it's the word gloss, black, glossing the word black. I wish I had like an extra half an hour and I could just spend it on why the word black is being glossed by the word black, but maybe another day. Um, and here we've got obviously a later gloss. 
Um, 13th century is the tremulous hand of Worcester. That's a known scribe um, called tremulous because like shaky hand. Um, if we spent literally five minutes on this and I showed you lots of examples of the tremulous hand of Worcester, you would just know, right? You're, it's very distinctive, very distinctive writing. See the kind of tremble is there? We'd only have to spend a very few minutes, maybe only, only three. Maybe we spent enough time already and I'd better show you a manuscript and you better say, it's the tremulous hand of Worcester. That means in the 13th century, if I see these glosses, this manuscript was in Worcester, right? And he glossed an awful lot of manuscripts. Um, in Worcester, uh, M.R. James says you can't teach the art of assigning dates to manuscript. He says, I'm even inclined to think it cannot be taught, right? By which you say, right, you need to expose them to lots of material. They'll get it. Right? If you see enough ma manuscripts, can you hear me still? It says I'm stable. You can hear me? Okay. Constanta, please tell me if I fade away. Okay. So, you know, so my question was, and with my colleagues was, what can we do from a computer assisted point of view and how could we have an evidence-based approach to scholarship so we created a bit of software in 2011 called archetype it's got a number of different components it's modular so you've got a faceted search you'll see it, a text editor if you want to transcribe your text an annotator so you can begin to create um, annotations and say let's cut out lots of examples of the letter z um, and that was with colleagues at king's digital lab uh, King's College London. And here's what our framework um, did, you know, so most software projects arise from a need to solve a set of problems. So as academics in the field of paleography, here were our, our issues. Um, as we saw, a scholar might state a manuscript is from mid 13th century in Northern France, but how can others test that expert judgment? It's not good enough for them to say, I know what it looks like. How could they test it? How could they compare things? Um, what how could they investigate the decision-making processes that lay behind a claim? We'll see some examples in a second that allow us to date something potentially. Uh, is there a way for students to learn to make their own identifications? You don't want them keeping having to go to Gandalf or whatever, you know, to get the to get the answer to a particular date. And how can researchers share their findings? If I say, oh, this particular letter form is unusual, you know, in my corpus of manuscripts, how can you share that? How can you test it? How can you demonstrate that? How can you prove it? So, um, so what we did was we created um, our software framework, which we'll see in a second. Uh, it's a set of tools linked through a web interface. It's online, free software. You can, if you're a programmer, you can do excellent stuff to open source software. Um, it's for paleography and the curation of data. So here's um, this project called DigiPal, which looked at 11th century English vernacular scripts, and this was our test case for developing the. The software, you see like we've annotated the letter B. I'll show you how this all works in a second. Um, we manually annotated, manually annotated 85,000 different, um, different letter forms. Here it says 62,735. That's an early screenshot. We're only 62,000 in, you know, another well, 20,000 more to go. And essentially what we did was we said we're going to break up each letter form into different component parts. So here's the letter G in the in um, uh, early medieval English script. So we've got three parts. It's the, a tail, a body, and a top stroke. So we go through and we'll like draw a box and say this is the G, and then we'll say we can describe different parts and search using the database, search for different parts. We can say, hey, I want to see all the top strokes that are curved or flat or small, narrow, something like that. But the first thing was to decide on the terminology. So no one's gonna argue if this is a G. Um, you know, if you put three paleographers in a room, certainly in Latin studies, uh, you get three paleographers in a room, you get five or six opinions. Here we had to like, one of our challenges was to get a group together, discover, you know, decide what we wanted to describe and then just make a decision about terminology. Okay. So we've got, tail, body, and top stroke. That's our three main parts of the letter G. And then you can have lots of different features of the G. The G can be closed. It can be three quarters open, open on the left, in the middle, right, on the right, narrow, oval, round, angular. And that was our vocabulary. That's most of what's going to happen to the letter G um, in, our, in our corpus of 11th century manuscripts. This one's kind of striking when you see it. 
anyway, so the approach we took was mostly morphology. So I'll show you, like with ductus, you're looking at how was the thing written, right? The number, as you know, right? The number, the order, the direction of strokes, you know this, right? Um, we weren't looking at that so much. We were looking at shape, like the shape on the page. That's easier with a computer image to do that. It's not impossible to do ductus, but it's a starting point was there are certain letter shapes we want to find. Let's draw boxes around them, as you'll see, and describe them. So, Constanta, you're going to be on the spot all day. Sorry, that's just the way it's going to go. Um, you heard me explain the terminology here. It's a bit complicated. Let's see if you followed it. Um, is this tail open or closed? That's open. Oh, that's very good. Okay, I'm going to give you one more. What about this one? Uh, which, okay. These ones here. They look closed. Amazing. Okay, so you've understood what we're trying to do. That I'm very, very impressed. I mean, you can see why you're at such a high level. Okay, so that's literally what we wanted to do, to begin to create groupings and ask the software, ask the computer to show us them, right? So the way this works is with archetype is you decide what's being described, you decide what to call, call it. So unlike those other systems where like transcribers, where you say, I'm gonna teach it how to read Greek, I'm gonna teach it how to read Hebrew. With this thing, you literally just throw a box, I'm gonna show you in a second, you say what it is. You can decide what to annotate, you know, where you draw your boxes, draw everything by hand. And then you do searches based on the vocabulary that you created. So there's no training data. Um, what you do is based upon your research questions. So here we are, we've got this, uh, example from a Hebrew manuscript. And so what I've done is I've said I'm going to describe the letter Shin, then I've manually drawn a box. I'm going to do this for you live in a second. And once I've described that and said that's the letter Shin, there it is in Hebrew, I can then describe different parts of it, different features, that's Aleph actually, and then say, oh, Aleph's come up again, no worries. Um, show me all the alephs in the database or show me all the letter ions and you can start to get lists of them. We can do this live in a second, that'll be more, more, make more sense. Um, so you describe what to do and it can be used for anything. This is a project where I wanted to describe um, images of the Exodus from Egypt. So there you've got Pharaoh and you know I can say, that's Pharaoh, show me images of Pharaoh, he's male, he's seated and he's Pharaoh. Can you see that? So there's no, underlying decisions the software framework is making at all. You make everything. You say, when I draw my box, what's inside that box? It could even be, I don't know, um, Old Slavonic, you could have, for instance, potentially, right? So here we are, look, I've said, show me all the living being heads in my database, and you see them all come up. And these are all the images of Pharaoh that I put in so far. Here are all the seated men in the manuscript. Um, here's an example, Mark. Mark Michael Epstein says in the 14th century Golden Haggadah, there are more images of women in that manuscript than any other Hebrew manuscript from the 14th or the 15th century. Right, so he says that, that's exciting, that's fine. I thought, let's test it, because he tells us that, right? But how can we see them? I want to see them in their context. You know, so I created a database where we can see like all the living being heads. We can see just the women here, all the female heads, and begin to look at them. So the important thing to remember is like, this is our annotation viewer, but when you click on the, any of those annotations, you see the full context. And we're gonna see that's important for script, obviously. So that's the image it's gone to. There's the cutout head of, Mir of Miriam, and there's the whole, the whole text. Okay. So we're gonna have a look at this project, which was using Archetype. It was an AHRC funded project from 2014, 2017, Models of Authority, which looking at 12th and 13th century manuscripts uh, in Latin from Scotland. So there's one of them. I'll give you a few seconds to look at this bathe in the glory of a 12th century Scottish manuscript, Scottish charter. Now, as I said, you decide what to annotate. For this corpus, this is quite a small document. Right, we had 700 charters in our project, 700 charters, and I did all the annotations myself, and I decided for many of the charters, because this is small, um, to annotate every single letter form virtually. Right? If it was a whole manuscript, then you're not going to annotate every single letter form, because we don't need necessarily 50,000 or 100,000 examples of the letter B, but for an object like this, I wanted most things annotated. So we're gonna work through an example here. Uh, 
I drew a box manually around the Tyronean symbol um, for et, for and, and then you can do a search and say, show me all of them. Great, right? There they are. And that's some of them. And you notice some of them have got a line through this shaft here, and some of them don't. Okay, so those have got a thing through, for instance, those don't. So I thought, okay, we'll go back and we'll create more terminology. We'll say that the shaft is crossed, right? That was the language we decided on. We decided to call this the shaft. That's the head stroke, that's the shaft. That was our thing, and it's been crossed. So now I can say, don't show me all the examples of them. Show me just the ones that have the shaft that's crossed. And then we plotted them on a timeline. So the archetype does that, creates a timeline. So here's our project. It goes from like 1100 roughly to 1280. And if you notice, sometime after the year 1200, can you see this okay? Is that appearing on your screen? Okay, good. Um, sometime after the year 1200, you start to see the cross coming into the thing, see it? Right. So not all of them have that. This is like a way of visualizing the data. It's giving us a hint as to what might be going on. So the computer's not telling us, right? We've already dated these manuscripts. It's just displaying, or this chart is, it's displaying from the timeline with Western examples. So, you know, if I picked up that charter, I'd say, oh, definitely after the year 1209 or something. And you'd say, why? And I'd say, well, look, let's have a look at the database, right? It's because after 1200 and something, you start to get this line coming up here, right? It doesn't happen earlier, right? If I saw one over here, with a line through it, I'd say, okay, we're gonna to have to look again at the dating of that thing. It could be, you know, a scribe might have, a, you know, <laughs> be very precocious and there's always one who's gonna be the first person to do this, right? Um, influence was coming from other countries like England on Scotland at this period anyway. But, you know, it doesn't tell you the answer. It gives you an idea of how to understand what's happening in the corpus is the idea, right? To give you a hint about how to understand. It's also a text editor. I'm gonna run through this very quickly because I know that's not um, super relevant to your project, but you can, break down the charters, say all the different clauses, search by particular clauses. Here I've just said to show us the, uh, show us the witness clauses. There they are. You can export as TI, XML, if you like doing that kind of thing, which is great to share your, we edited all the texts. And in the same way as we had a timeline for our, um, you know, for our letter forms, you can also, goes through because all the 700 texts have been edited. So we can say, how often does the phrase sciatus me or sciatus quad appear in the corpus? And you can see that the ones in blue are sciatus me and sciatus quad in green. You can immediately see like which particular phrase is the most common in this particular corpus. Something I'd, I'd like, you know, that was important to us to think about was if you've got a manuscript full of, you know, 250 pages, I don't know, 100,000 letter forms. What do you annotate? I had a conversation with the director, executive director of the Medieval Academy of America, Lisa Fagan Davis, and she's working on 12th century um, Austrian texts. And in her corpus, CT was a very important letter form for dating, for working out, um, you know, how to assign a region. And I was interested in that and I hadn't paid much attention to CT in our corpus and I went through and you can see there's a, a lot of difference. Look, and it actually became, you know, that kind of conversation with other scholars really helped us think about what we might annotate. But for her, that's like a starting point as I understand it, like start with the CT thing. The other thing I wanna say is when we were deciding on terminology, and I think this was huge, we, there was a group of us working on this and one of the things that we talked about is like, for instance, is this CT a ligature? And, you know, in some cases it might be, in other cases it might not. We might say, we've got to go back and see the original charter. We might say, let's decide. We had an hour discussion about what actually a ligature was. Like it's not two letter forms pressed close to each other, right? It's where one, we might say, it's where one stroke replaces or is a component part of another Thing and it saves you doing that. That's definitely not the case here. This is just a stylistic thing. So in the end, what we decided was not to call them ligatures at all, because then it would be up to the whim of the person doing the annotation. You know, they might say, I've decided this one's a ligature, but not that one, right? That's very subjective. We decided to call it, I don't know if you can see over here, like a character sequence. So we said, let's mark up all of the CT combinations, 
Um, we're not going to argue about this term ligature. We're just going to say it's a character sequence and then we're liberated. And that's something that was huge, like not thinking beyond that, just saying, we'll just call it a character sequence, then we can mark up as many as we want, and then you can make your decision when you look at our, our search. Okay, and we can do lots of other plotting. Oops, I went backwards, sorry. Go and do that. Oh, Lisa made quite a nice animation for us, where you can see in her corpus. So one of the things that you can do with this, here's my example of cut out letter, letter T, obviously. Um, these are from the, like from the section that starts the witness list in charters. So you're gonna have a phrase like testibus or his testibus. So I mark them all up. I can arrange them by date. There we are. And I can say, oh, look, those look kind of similar to each other. So let's mark them up. I can add them to a favorites list. So you put a star here and then you can share them with other people. So if I said, my whole scholarly argument is based upon these three examples of the letter T, um, you can share a, a URL. Someone can come into the database because our database is public and live. Um, they can come into the database and they can look at how frequent those examples are. They can test my argument. That's the evidence-based thing, right? I'm not just saying these three examples are, you know, very important to know the following thing, and you just have to trust me. You can actually go in and see, you know, on the basis, you know, where my argument came from and test those out. There's also a digital light, light box where you can drag them around and compare them. It's kind of quite fun. And we can lay them on top of each other there and see like how similar they are to each other. Could it be the same scribe, same scriptorium? We can alter the opacity. And you can do another thing. I'm gonna give you one more example. So this is in um, early medieval English script. There are three versions of the letter Y. There's a straight shaped one. There's a round shaped one. And there's my very favorite, the F shaped one. So it kind of looks like the letter F. Yeah, but that's the letter Y. There it is in the word. Like, so this is obviously the word. Come on, Constante, what does that say? No, not gefilte. What does it say? <laughs> yes, guilta. Guilta, okay. So we can see. So most paleographers say the F shape Y does not occur in the 11th century in England. It disappears, right? So if you see the F shape Y, um, it's probably earlier than the 11th century. Not always, but that's one of our diagnostics. So in our uh, project looking at um, English vernacular minuscule, we marked up 1,500 different hands. And then you see it's giving us 30 examples in nine hands in the 11th century. So of our 1,500 hands, nine of them in the 11th century use this. So we can say, yes, that is quite, that backs up the general idea, right? It's not impossible for the letter that Y that's shaped like an F to appear, but once we look at the dates, they're all very early, right? So first of all, this one is actually the end of the 10th century because we went a bit further, you know, we went before the, like the long 11th century, right? We went a bit before the beginning of the 11th century, um, but they're all early, right? So a scribe learning to write in the year 999 um, didn't necessarily know that Stuart and Peter Stokes were gonna make a decision about to mark these things up, right? They may have a writing career of 20, 25, 30 years, they continue writing like that. But that's like the evidence-based approach. The evidence-based approach is to say, we're not just telling you it's from this date, we can um, show you examples. Here's a few more, few more things we did with Archetype. We, I marked up the Bayo tapestry, some of the letter forms, as well as the um, birds and other things. Um, here we've got some gospel manuscripts. We've got a project at the Bibliothèque Nationale um, to look at, um, script on coins, and plenty more things also. Constanta, how am I doing for time? I, I mean, yeah, it's... Give me a, tell, tell me how much longer you would like me to speak for. 
for me, it's so interesting that you could go on forever. <laughs> but, no, how long um, for now? Because I'll show you some demonstrations and then you can take questions. Yeah, let's do it like that. Give me a time though. You have to give me a time. Um, I don't know, 10 more minutes? 10 more minutes. Do? Perfect. That's the precise amount of time that I was hoping for. All right. So I'm going to show you these projects now. So let's have a go at this. Has that appeared? I don't know if that worked. Let me try again. Okay, can you see that? Okay. So this is the Models of Authority database. As I said, it's online. It's showing you um, the manuscripts from the charters of, from the 12th to the 13th century. So when we go in here, we can do a search. So the first thing we needed to do was establish our corpus, like what's in our corpus. No one, you know, and we made a number of decisions, right? We made decisions on the basis of, um, are these things accessible? Will they ever be able to be digitized? Like some are in private ownership and we forgot about those because they were impossible to digitize. Others were inaccessible. So we went for the ones that were in public collections and Have an online project if uh we can't sorry, even sorry. can i can i ask you to repeat because we lost you for a moment okay so as i said like the first thing we did with this project was to sit down and establish our corpus right and say we want to have an, an online project um we need to be able to digitize the things how can you know what will we have access to so that was very practical right there were some things we would have loved to have had but we thought we're not going to spend all our time trying to persuade um the earl of lothian or someone it's a made up person uh, in this case, um, to give us, you know, access to this image. Um, let's just go with what's available. And that was mostly in uh, publicly accessible repositories. And then we talked about, you know, where they might be, you know, where they might be amenable to digitization. So here's our corpus. We've got our, our 700 manuscripts there. Let's see more of them like that. And you can categorize, you know, can display them by date and other things like that. Then more exciting than seeing a list of names of Durham Cathedral Arch Archives, we can look at the, the images. Okay, so we've got 728 images. And if you click on any of these, you go to the, the charter. You should see, there it is. So you can like zoom in, right? So that's the, the images and you can browse through those. Then we've got our, our text, which are the transcribed things, which we're not going to look at because I think that's not super relevant. But then we've got our, our graphs, which are our cutout letter forms. So this is what you saw me showing screenshots of earlier. And we can see them. So, so far I've like cut out nearly 20,000 for this project. Okay, so let's have a look. And we can look at letters, like letter forms, or we can look at particular abbreviations or sequences or punctuations or accents. They were the things that we were interested in, right? There are other things you could decide to describe. So if I say, let's show me the abbreviations, we can see them here. And then I can say, let's see different types of abbreviation. Let's see, I don't know, the abbreviation for pair. Yeah. And you can see it's mostly uh, a line through that thing. Oh, nice glitch down there. And I can arrange them by, by text dates. And you can begin to see like, how that might work for our corpus. And they're all pretty regular, right? The letter forms are, uh, might vary, but like it's normally aligned through the downward shaft. We can look at like, if we want more variety, we can say, okay, let's see the abbreviation for like US, like bus or something. And we can say, okay, look, there's lots, lots of different versions. You can have one that's shaped like the letter nine over here. Let's put that in our favorites, I like that. Uh, a three shaped abbreviation for bus, like this one kind of here, or one that's shaped kind of like a semicolon there. So you see, I've favorited those, right? I've liked those ones. And now if I go up to my collection here, Look, there's my letter T's I put in there earlier, but here are these. I can rearrange them. 
And again, if my whole academic argument was based upon these examples here and these abbreviations here, I just would click on share. And that's created a link, which you can put in your footnote in your article or elsewhere that will allow someone to go into the database and see it will reproduce this collection. Okay, so you can you can do that and you can search by clauses and you can search by people. They're the things that we marked up. But I want to show you actually manually like how the marking up process works. So let's find something that hasn't, okay, this one, hmm, it's not an easy to reach out. So let's find something a bit. Okay, let's try this one. This one's got one annotation so far. I haven't, I didn't show it much love. Okay, didn't show much love. Okay, so here it is. I'll put it on my screen. I'll zoom it up. Okay. Um, okay, so there's the letter G. I like the letter G. So from the drop down, I'm going to say, let's choose the letter G like that. Okay, and I'm going to draw my box like that. I'm now going to save it. And that's it. That's in the database now. So that's the process. Like identify the letter form you want. Let's do another one. Let's do the letter N. Okay, we'll do that. Make sure I don't do capital by mistake. Okay, um, draw my box. And then save it. Wow, another one. Okay, that's also in the database. Um, we looked at, well, look, if I click on our on our G here, let's look at that back. Um, I can begin to describe different aspects of it. Like, is the tail open? Like, is it swelling, tapering? Is it looped? Is there an approach stroke, right? There are different things you can do. Again, this was the vocabulary we created. One of the reasons why it's so it works so well is a number of people working on this project. Each person might have a different vocabulary, but because we had like our structured options here, we all have to use the same system. So it created a consistency. Uh, you know, I've worked on projects where it's just manually describing things, you know, and, you know, someone might say that the tail is mostly closed, right? Or um, the tail has an upward flick, which leads, you know, back towards the body or to the eternal straight, right? This creates a consistency, which meant that, you know, many people working uh, on this could, you know, would work in the same way. So let me go back to where we were before. So that's the idea of creating those, um, those annotations. And if we go into the database here, you'll see. So lots of different options here, but we're gonna look at the symbols. So here, this is where you describe and create the names of things. So we've got our characters. So we gave them these names. We didn't invent these names. Um, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? They were there. We had them. You have the same for your old Slavonic as well, that all your things have names, right? So as you explained to me, Constanta, um, and we decided what we wanted. So at this point, I'm saying, these are the abbreviations I want. So I create, put them into the database. And we've got types here. So is it an abbreviation? Is it an accent? Is it a character? Is it a letter? Is it a punctuation? So then I create my character and I say, when I click on it, um, it tells me the letter A is minuscule and it's a letter. That's where it is in the database. It's a minuscule form, it's not uh, majuscule, and it's part of the letter form. So that's the, the main kind of holding space, if you like, character. And then we've got allograph, where we can say, like E, it's an E, or is it an E with a cedilla or E cow data? And we create them here and give them slightly different names. So there are different shape types of R in, you know, in our database. Um, there's like one that looks like uh, a two, so that's a two-shaped R. So if I click on that, I've created that, and it says its name is two-shaped, it's a character R, and it's a letter form. That's what we're doing. And then you create all the different, um, if I go out of here, you can create different component parts. Remember how we split G into head stroke, body, and tail? So here you say, look, um, You've got like a limb or a lobe or a stem or a tongue on the E, for instance, we created those. Let's have a look at abbreviation shapes. So abbreviation shape, remember we had nine shaped, we had um, three shaped and we had one that looked like a semicolon. So I create abbreviation shape and then I go down to features and I can say my abbreviation shape can be three shaped, nine shaped or 
um, semicolon shapes. That's that. Now, one of the nice things about this, the way we, that we designed this, is we wanted two things, because there were many people working on the project at different points, and especially with DigiPal, the 11th century vernacular minuscule one, we had a number of interns working on it, and we wanted to give them credit, see like who produced which annotations, you know, rather than just say, okay, fine, you did this project, um, we gave you some money for it because we did pay them, and off you go. So if we go into, let's see if I can find it. <coughs> Use this, yeah. This will tell us all the people who, who worked on this at different points, and we should be able to see, maybe it's in annotations. Yes, it's in annotations. We can see who produced which annotations. So I can look by username. So I can say, how many did, um, let's find this, how many did this guy, T Toby, produce? And it's telling us he produced, a, he produced like 1,491 annotations. Or we can say, how many did the PI produce? No, I shouldn't say that, that's not right. Um, how many did, because that wasn't his job. How many did, did Stuart produce? Oh. Um, he produced 21,000 of them, okay. So we can go through and we see those kind of thing. That's good for attribution and giving credit to people, but it was also good because like on our other project, DigiPower, we had a lot of interns working on it and many of them couldn't read Old English. So to some degree, we taught them how to read Old English, but there are many letter forms that look similar. Like the letter P also looks like the letter Thorn, also looks like the letter Win. So I could go through and oversee it and say, these are the letter forms they're confusing. They've created lots of annotations for us. Everybody knows what an A, B, a C, or D is, but the specific letter forms that are uh, part of Old English, they can't see what they, they can't see what they are. So I can go in and like do an overview, do like quality control on, on, on that okay so that's quite quite a nice feature of that and again it allows a lot of checking a lot of consistency what we've done with this project is um, the way this works is um there are many manuscripts which we're still working on which we're not ready to allow to go public so if i show you whoops i didn't mean to end the share sorry uh, bring it back just finally what i'll show you is this which is like when we started, we didn't have permissions for everything. So what we could do is we could put all of the images into the database and then say, which ones are we gonna to allow to be live? So this is my working progress thing. It says there are 728 images. We're getting like permissions and final sign off on some of those things. But if I log out, oops. It's now telling us there are 114 images because we're still waiting for permissions. As soon as we get our permissions in, I'll just flick a switch and another 300 will immediately become visible. So that's quite nice. Like it's a publicly accessible site. People can see our work in progress, what we're doing, um, but we don't have to make everything we're doing visible yet until we're ready, until we've gone through and said, okay, are we happy with this, right? Uh, my job in the next six months is to try and make everything go live. Um, We'll see. Um, the PI decided, made me and Joanna Tucker directors of this project so we can, you know, do, get this all, all, all working. You know, that gives you a taste of what's happening here. The, the thing I most wanted to bring out was like deciding what the corpus is, deciding what you were going to annotate, what's relevant to your corpus, because you know that, right? You know what's relevant and, you know, how you might categorize those things, uh, view them. There's one more thing I will show you quickly, which is when we go into the manuscript viewer. So let me click on this. Um, okay. And this is where it's like really good for teaching. I've got 142 annotations here. That's quite a lot. Um, I can turn off the annotations or turn them on. That's great. But I can go into the filter and I can say, what do I want to be visible and not? So first of all, I'll turn everything off and I'll say, I just want the Tyronean sign. Remember we saw that for Anne to be visible. And that allows students to go in here and say, okay, I'm going to try and work out what these different letter forms are. You know, what's the abbreviation for con? So let's bring that up. Where is it gone? So should, yeah, there it is. So that thing here tells you, tells you that word is like consensu, right? So they can go through and say, I didn't know the abbreviation for con, what is it? As soon as they've identified that, 
they can then go and say like show me all the examples in the database so a lot of students have learned that, learned how to read these medieval manuscripts by going through and it would work very well for your corpus right because apparently not everyone reads old slavonic apparently um so you can begin to go through we mentioned two shaped r so i can just see how two shaped r um we can see them there it is somewhere where is it gone um let me bring it up from here so here's our list of annotations where's two shaped r there it is it shows you them here and there they are see it looks like kind of like the number two and I can click on that. And why it's going a bit slow at the moment. And there it is. And if I click on this thing here, it shows me all the examples in the menu, in the charter, and I can move around and see them all just like that. All right, that's a lot of talking from me. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. So Thank you so much. That was um, really, really interesting. Um, I have questions, but um, I'm also uh, opening the floor for everyone who wants to jump in. The first one, so um, Kugel, please go on. First of all, could, could I ask you to tell me how to pronounce your name? Well, my name is Tin, actually. Oh, it is Tin, sorry. That's <laughs> just the it, 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 not the opposite kind of. Uh, thing. Thank you very much for this super interesting um, presentation of the framework. It's super applicable, I feel, for any kind of paleography. And as I'm a musician and musicologist <laughs> that easily recognized the Beethoven and Bach kind of situation. <laughs> uh, we say that now. <laughs> I, I did I did laugh inside when you put it. It was pretty, pretty good, pretty good. Um, I was wondering, I mean, I see that it's very applicable, applicable and it would be applicable also in music paleography um, because it recognizes images rather than actual letters or words, right? Uh, uh, letters, yeah, letters, not words. Um, so I'm wondering if you know of any examples that your framework has been used for recognizing music, music script. All right, so that, that's a great question. I just I want to be super clear, like it's not recognizing anything, right? Sorry, sorry. Um, no, yeah, I just want to be because it's hard to get past that, right? Because we're like all evidence yeah, yeah. recognition. It's literally the idea. I'm going to say this like really clearly. The idea is you would go in if you're working on mu music manuscripts or whatever. Um, you would go in and say, you know, you're the expert, right? You decide what to annotate, how frequently, and what to choose, right? So Samantha Blicken, I think, is the person I know who's done most. I think she, you know, she's looked at this. I don't think anyone's the thing is that, okay so I don't know of anyone who's actually used it for musicology in a um extended way I know Sean Curran I think at Oxford Do you know who that is? Yeah. I think that's his name um he definitely started to use it I'm not sure but it's downloadable software for free yeah, yeah, yeah. right so you know so I'll go to a conference and every single time someone will come up to me and say hey I used it and I like I've, like you were never into how did I even know you were like you know people often don't tell me they're like using it but there's definitely I definitely think it's very applicable to music um Musicology, and so that's a a great a great question. Again, you have to think like the, the thing is always like, what's your research question? Yeah. If you've got a research question where it'd be really good to mark up a huge corpus of manuscripts with musical notation in, that's perfect, right? So that's a way, and you can structure it and stuff. So again, that's our, our your research question. Like all projects, it lies at the heart of it. It's not what does the computer do? What will it offer? Can it can you know? Can you feed your stuff into Transcribus and then it plays it out through a MIDI thing and then you hear the music? Might maybe that's useful to some people. Might what you want, right? So your question is that you know that those research questions is the, the thing. But I think it's Sean Curran. I think has done most with most with it. Hey, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for the question. Um, any other questions? Um, I was wondering uh, myself, so say, um, you know, I decide that I want to analyze 10 manuscripts coming from Bulgaria from the 14th century. Um, when it comes to terminology, um, so two questions, uh, how adaptable do you think what you've done for the Latin script is it to my to the to the Cyrillic, and um, how 
um, yeah, basically, can I create my own vocabulary in a way and say, or or would I need to adapt to what's already out there? You know what I mean? All right. So now, when you that's a great question. Okay, that's like very important. I mean, the main thing is you can when you start. Just going to bring an example. But when you when you start using this, you, you know, it will either come if you download it, it will, it will come with like A B C D E F G H, right? And you just delete all that and you start again. You can create whatever you want. So let me see if I can bring up my, remember I was showing you for the Hebrew yeah. manuscript examples. Let me see if I can bring that up again, because I think that might help. Um, I don't know if that's worked. Where are you? Can you see my PowerPoint on the screen with like the letter Aleph? Yeah. And stuff. Okay, so this is entirely different to anything that's happening with a Latin manuscript. Right, we've got these connectors here, we've got short diagonal strokes, we've got this thing like left diagonal stroke. So, you know, I don't know if that, if that makes sense to you. Like, you know, it's not the same as a Latin manuscript, right? In the same way as my picture of um, the evangelists or Pharaoh was also entirely different. So the thing you're going to do with this is like, say whatever your letter form is, what was it called? The one that looked like a Z? Oh, sorry, Zimlia, yeah. Okay, right, so you, you say that here, and then you decide like, what are the different parts of it? It looked like kind of had a big tail thing in the example you showed me kind of coming down. So you might say, I'm going to, that's going to be one of my component parts. So you type in whatever your vocabulary is. If you can type in some names into Microsoft Word, to, to do this, you can definitely type it into this if that makes sense, right? So you just create new, let me show you. Um, one second. Okay. I think it's easier to show it really. Let me just bring it up. Okay. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Okay, so I've gone into the database. I'm saying I'm going to have a new symbol. So I'm going to call it, I'll call it an important name. What should I call it? Um, Okay. There it is. Okay, so I think that's one of the important things in your database. And I say, what is it? Is it a majuscule, minuscule, or not? <laughs> it's obviously a majuscule because you're a very important person. Okay, and I'm going to say, what is it? Is it any of these letters that I should have said? I'm going to say it's a form of punctuation. So it's a majuscule form of punctuation. So I can then create that. Should I save it? One day someone will go through and say, we're not quite sure what this was, but it was obviously a very important thing. Okay, so there it is on my, on my list somewhere here. Let's come down to the bottom, where are you? So important that it can be found. There it is. Okay, so it's there, it's there, it's there. And now I have to decide, you know, what to break it down into. So in other words, Whatever vocabulary you want, whatever names you want, you enter as easily as that. Like create a new name of the letter. Like we, when we go back to our, our start, um, we decided we were going to have these types, right? Abbreviation, accent, character sequence, letter, punctuation. If this was images, I may, might say something like um, like anthropom or human form or whatever, and then head and then leg and then other things. So the first thing is human form. That's our top of our um hierarchy if we like and then coming down from human form we break up the human form we say like head leg body uh, like that so you can create your uh which i've forgotten its name already like zinya okay we can let's pretend it was called that um you know you add that in here so you decide what is it it's a letter let's say it's a letter of the alphabet so you decide whatever these things are you just create them right in your list and then you go down again you say i'm going to call it a character so the idea here is like, imagine your scribe is writing something. They have to decide which type of script they're writing. Then in their head, they have an idea about what they're writing. And then in reality, they write their best attempt at that. Yeah. So we've got, what is it? 
right? What do they think it is and what do they actually write? So that's the difference between our characters and our allographs. The character is like, what are we calling it? And the allograph is like the example they, they've made. Yeah. Helping. So in other words, you can do whatever you like, um, whether it's like call it a crotchet, call it a constanta, or call it a two-shaped R, like all of those things are, are important. And again, like, I, like the, the main thing is to decide what it is you want to describe and why, what will that allow you to do? And what's your research question? So for Lisa Fagan Davis, it was the CT character sequence. Marking out lots of examples of that and searching for them allows her to find out something about the date, the location and stuff of her manuscript. For, for your corpus, it might be something else. Or it might be everything. You could, you know, draw boxes around everything and that will give you a sense of how script changes in your corpus, potentially. And um, am I right in understanding that even today, if I were to have um, my corpus, so if I were to decide already on um, the data that I want to analyze, I could literally just download the software and start creating my own collection uh, and working on it. Exactly. So it's free, you can download it. It's totally easy to put it on your computer, especially if you've got a Mac, but it does work on other things as well. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, no, it does work on Windows um, and Linux. But the more complicated thing is to put it on a server. Okay. That's more complicated and you need like institutional support. And the reason to put it on a server is to make it publicly available and to do collaborative work. Yeah. So if you've got a whole team that wanna do this. I mean, when we talked about this, the other thing that can come out of this conversation is, you know, if you've got money and you're applying for funds, you can say, we like this approach. Right, but we want to create our own tool. What we very much wanted to do with this tool was to make it so it worked for any corpus. And that's really why I was trying to show you like it will work for an image, it will work for any language because there are no underlying assumptions apart from you have to be able to draw a box around it. Yeah. Right, and so it is. That's the, there's no, but there's no, nothing saying you don't have to train it is the point. But yes, if you want to put it on a, on a server somewhere that's more complicated, but not impossible because we managed to do it. So, you know. Okay, anyone um, else feeling brave <laughs> to ask a question? Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, thinking about this, we uh, in Colombia have an, a local archive uh, about Spanish uh, colonial uh, documents. And we were thinking uh, in working on this kind of um, digitized and uh, paleographic exercises. It's uh, if we want uh, to do that, uh, we can get any support from, from you. Like for example, uh, it's a different language because everything is in English, but um, uh, we will be delighted to, um, um, explore these uh, tools. Fantastic. I mean, I'm always happy to help people. Like if you say I've installed it somewhere online, for instance, or you say, here's my local thing, I'll like totally be very happy to say to you, oh, wow, because it's always exciting to see new projects and say like, okay, um, this is how you create your vocabulary or this is how you link things together. Because I've done it like many times. It's very easy for me. It seems intuitive. Um, I'm happy to always support. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you so much. A great idea. No, I would be very delighted to, to, to do that. And, you know, the more people that try these things, the better, really. I mean, as I said, like, underlying it is like, you know, if your platform is just for viewing things and yeah. for making it publicly available, like, you know, IIIF is great. And, you know, and other platforms are great for that as well. Um, if your like, idea is that you really want to explore the paleography and visualizing like how the writing works, and this is a good tool for that. It's really thinking about what's your what's your priority and your interest with it with yeah. your material. It would be amazing. We have a tiny collection about a uh, slavery in Colombia, well, and we've been digitizing these manuscripts, um, and we have already uh, one hundred digitized, and we would like to start uh, from there. Oh, fantastic! Are they on online at the moment? 
Yeah, we don't have a server, but we've been working on a website and putting everything in, in um, yeah. <laughs> I can uh, show you, uh, provide you the link here, wait. Okay, no, great, that, I would like to see that, it's good. Thank you for the, thank you for that. Thank you. That's um, okay. And uh, we have um, a, ta a tiny, like, everything is in Spanish, but um, it's, a, it's a work, a local work about uh, this space. It's not an archive uh, per se. It's more like um, a laboratory of creation. Uh, and we have uh, um, different sources of information. The, the biggest one is uh, this colonial about, um, mm, I don't know how to say this. Um, uh, criminal records, uh, civil records of the uh, um, 17th century, 18th and 19th. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, sounds, that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. I don't know if, Marie, if you've found already Professor Brooks's um, email address. Otherwise, I don't know if um, Stuart can share it with us. Um, and otherwise, there was also Elisabetta with a question, although she withdrew her hand. <laughs> OK. Uh... Thank you for this um, uh, absolutely amazing lecture and the matter is amazing. Uh, but I would go back to one of the simple questions. So I am going back to the beginning, when? Uh, because uh, I was thinking all the time that uh, comparing of all these letter forms, for example, gives an idea of the historical development Mm -hmm. of a script or whatever we should call a style or a script or well it is another ter uh, terminal terminological issue but uh, i wouldn't uh, attach it at the moment but uh, i realized that you had a lot of manuscripts dated like 11th century 10th century 12th century mm -hmm. does it mean that you dated them according to uh, the information you developed and uh, 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 and took from your uh, uh, images, or you just rely upon the dates given by, I don't know, scholars, catalogers, and these dates could be wrong. So when you build this time, uh, the, the picture of the time, I, I don't remember how you called it, uh, but I wondered how, how you deal with this. If you, do you start simply said, do you start with dated manuscripts, with colophons, for example? All right, so that's a, a great thing. So there were two different projects I showed, really. So the one that was the models of authority, which is looking at the charters, um, most of the charters have got an internal text date. You know, this was written on the 14th of May, you know, in the year 1237. Or um, they refer to, you know, a particular issue, like, you know, King David, you know, issues this thing, and we know what the thing. So our starting place with those was to say, we're going to accept the date within the charter that it says it's from, right? We'll do that. And so we did that. So it's not, the date's not based on script. They're based solely on the internal contents because they're all mostly dated charters. Once we've done that, we then returned to them and said, okay, are we happy with those dates? Now we've got them all in here. So it might be in terms of linguistic forms, like the spelling, the diplomatic, other things in there, uh, as well as the paleography. So an example, you know, with like the Tyronean 7 with the line through it, right? Um, you know, if we saw one that was 1105, we might say, um, I think this is suspicious, let's say. Let's see, on the basis of the visualisation, let's revisit that. Um, we got to the point after working on these documents for about four years where we began to be suspicious about a significant amount of the corpus and we said let's stop quickly before we say but you know it's the difference between with charters you say things like as i'm sure you know like um you know is it a contemporary original or is it a non-contemporary original in other words um did someone copy out the same information 100 years later because their charter was worn out mm -hmm. right 
the thing that so we say like everything about this is authentic it's definitely authentic right you know sometimes a particular monastic institution will say you know oh we definitely had a, a document that told us we were given this by the king but we lost it um let's make another one right and you know and then all sorts of things go wrong both in terms of the script style and you know other things but sometimes they're non-contemporary original so that's like the the first answer is with that project but with digipal which was looking at 11th century english vernacular minuscule like a lot of our work here's was based upon this book, which is Donald Scraggs, late Donald Scraggs, um, Conspectus of Scraggle Writing in English. And he literally made a, better see this easily, but he made a catalogue of, you know, particular manuscripts, when a particular scribal hand started and when they ended on that manuscript. So I might say, you know, folio 42 recto, um, the first three words are by this scribe. And not, so that's where we got like our 1,500 scribes from in that database. And once we'd entered all the information here, which he kindly shared with us, um, we then got images and started to look at them and say, are we happy with the dates on the basis of the script? And some things we redated, but mm -hmm. it always made it easier to see things. Cause I could say like, show me all the letter G's. And then you see some of them begin to stand out. Yeah. Um, like the, the other thing, since I'll put the share up for just one minute. Um, the other thing that I really want to make clear is when we look here and that's a great question thank you um you know and i say okay let's look at all examples of letter d and you know we can arrange them according to the so look, text date right and you can go through and so you see like d starts off relatively simple that's why it's good for good for teaching and we go down and we've got lots of examples of them how many have we got um and we can go right to the end, let's skip to the end. And, oops, time to go to here. And then we're gonna see it's gradually becoming more cursive, mm -hmm. right? And that looks radically yeah. different. So if yeah, I yeah. select what, that one, select that one, select that one. Yeah, and you can see that, right? But the important thing there is not to say that's the answer. The important thing then is to click on this and go into the whole document and let me just take the magnification down. And look at the whole script and its context. So that's, so my friend, um, Tessa Weber from University of Cambridge, which is professor of paleography there, um, at our first project meeting for this project, we had all of the manuscripts loaded into the database we were all ready to do lots of kind of complicated things with like searches and things i've begun to do that she turned up with a book where she'd printed out all 700 manuscripts in color you know to size to you know and said that's the way i prefer to work with these things right so i was really learned a lot from that because what she really wants to do as all of us do if we're doing paleography is just look at it you know what's our impression of it you know, how carefully written is it? What's the size of this thing? You know, are there spaces between, you know, what kind of uh, punctuation systems being used? Um, you know, definitely once we've done all that, you could start to do searches. Look at our, like our opening O here, right? We can say, okay, look, there's Omnibus. I might say, I want to see how often omnibus is is uh, abbreviated like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just you see the letter O and M because everyone knows omnibus like is mm -hmm. going to be an opening. Um, how often do these things appear? So once you've done the work of like looking at the objects, whether it's in real life, whether it's printed out to scale, or whether it's the digital image, this is, will allow you to do some kind of searches on that, and I can can do that, uh, and that allowed some of our redating because we began to see. You know, if, if the, the earliest examples of it, no, we're not decorated like this. Right? Mm -hmm. If they come up as early, and then we'll begin to see when we can see our spectrum of different changes, we can say, okay, let's think about that. So again, it's just another hint and another way in to try and work out dates and times and time frames. Yeah, I, I, think, that I think that it is fantastic. Uh, I mean, the, the tools you use, uh, they are fantastic, this possibility to, uh, to compare images and even to uh, overlap them. And uh, it is uh, um, an excellent tool for, it could be for our project because it is uh, focused mainly on scribes. We are not so much interested in uh, the historical development of 
any kind of script, but we are interested in scribes. Mm -hmm. And what you showed us is really something that if we could use it, uh, would be would be a great benefit because that way we could learn about scribes and the way they uh, in the way they vary their around uh, handwriting because one scribe could uh, produce various forms of letters mm -hmm. and um, it is it is really a, a tool which which is as I said fantastic. And the other thing which I realized, and it is what we realize uh, every uh, every time we speak about the project, is that we need an excellent photographs, digitized digitized images, which we don't have. Yeah. At the moment, mm -hmm. and this is I think that for us it, it could be a uh, it could be a problem because we we discussed uh, we compared uh, digitized collections of various libraries in Europe for example we had such a uh, such a seminar and we realized that for example the national library of bulgaria unfortunately has images of a low quality they 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 are not suitable for such uh, research uh, and for such uh, taking uh, information from from the images we we have, so it is it is a problem. But it, it, it is not your problem, of course. I just <laughs> share. I just share what. Uh, that what is I a, see it's an interesting thing about that. Yeah. Have. When when the ten years ago when that DigiPower English Vernacular Minuscule pro, uh, project worked, most started. Most things were not digitized. Right now, almost everything 10 years on has been digitized that we want. But at the time, apart from in the Bodleian Library, uh, where I work. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in terms of British Library, in terms of Corpus Christi College Library, the Parker Library, like huge amounts of this stuff has been digitized. And it's very interesting that the first six months of that project, I was a research associate on that project. I spent six months in the British Library and I turned over the page, pages of every single early medieval English manuscript that was on our list. I looked at, I counted how many, you know, I calculated. I turned over more than 10,000 pages of manuscripts. But I didn't do that for my PhD. For my PhD, I looked at two manuscripts and a lot of detail, um, had a sense of what was out there. But it's different to like turning over 10,000 pages and just staring at them. And I thought, of those and what a dream, isn't it? I know, it was amazing, it was unbelievable. And, you know, my, my sole decision at that point was like, how many of these do we want to get photographed? And how much money do we have? <laughs> so we could afford at that point about 500 photographs, right? Of those, you know, 10,000 that I took, turned the pages over, that's what we could afford. And we had funding for that. And so it was always making a decision, right? I might say, wow, like the last top word on its own on this page, like has an amazing loop to sender of an S. I really <laughs> want to capture that. But there's only like one word on that whole page and that's one of my 500 gone. I just have to let it go. I just have to let it go. That's what I have to do. So it was those decisions. But again, thinking about that. So the, the most important thing that has come out of any of these digital projects, I think is not the resource itself, although those are great. It's the what we learned as scholars and what we take on, you know, in terms of teaching, in terms of bringing that, like the exposure we had, like you said, Constance, it was a dream, right? Um, you know, I was changed in terms of my understanding of the corpus from doing that, right? It doesn't matter how many catalogues I would have read, doesn't matter how much, you know, how many articles I would have read, I wouldn't really have had a sense of what was out there. And, you know, and once I finished the British Library, I then went to Cambridge and looked at the Corpus Christi College Library and turned over more pages. But we got lots of photographs. And again, you know, hopefully there's hope for you. I mean, you know, like, you know, 10 years on everything has been digitized. And, you know, if there's a way to attract funding from someone like Polonsky, that's amazing because it yeah. really. Yes. But we started in our early days. We did not have images of things. Um, we were still negotiating with different libraries about them. And we used scans from books. And they were kind of rubbish quality but they allowed us to do something, which was better than nothing, if that made sense. Uh -huh. So we could, it helped us to develop our, our thinking because then we could like order things and do searches and things. And we might say, ugh, that image is grainy. It's not what I want, but we could do something. It's not like, unless it's like 1200 DPI, you know, blah, 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 uh, a thousand um, gigabyte TIFF for each image, you know, I'm not gonna bother with it. It is possible to do things even if it's not ideal that's probably what i would add as well thank you thank, thank you very much
And I think it could be also of an advantage not to have um, so, I mean, if already something exists out there, then the library would say, well, it doesn't matter what's the quality, we've, we still, we've done something, right? If nothing exists and you go there with a certain standard or like some kind of requirement, then, you know, hopefully they'll just say, well, we are here, why not doing it in a, in a proper way, in a way. So it could be a, you know, yeah. Could be the right time for a project as ours to kind of fit into. It's definitely the right time. And you know, those manuscripts I looked at, I was immediately engaged, interested, and excited by them. Even though I, I will admit I couldn't read the script, I thought there's a lot of um, there's a lot of opportunity for promoting the manuscripts, promoting the repositories, and for them, you know, to, to start to put stuff online. I mean, that's a way of obviously attracting money that supports cultural heritage, that supports institutions. I mean, there are definitely funding bodies that can be applied to by the institutions, you know, if they're encouraged to do that. And in a way, it's foundational research, which a lot of funding institutions like. So if you present it as something that is necessary for any kind of other further research, it might attract a bit more kind of situation. We have the similar situation in Croatia, where I'm from. Um, and it's kind of the same similarities with some kind of course, some corpuses that are not really, not even digitized, but not accessible due right. to many different reasons. So it really limits a lot of research that hasn't been done. Um, so whenever you try to gain some, gain some funding from anywhere, I think it's always the most successful option is to, is to advertise it as foundational research, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And so probably the next two slots of seminars will be one on terminology marker, take take note, and then the other is how to get funding <laughs> or what's what's kind of the elements needed to. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that unless there are any other um, pressing questions, um, probably we should let Professor Brooks go. <laughs> okay. But it was extremely, extremely interesting. Thank you so much for your time. And, and you know, you really put heart into it and explained properly what, what's happening <laughs> well, from Gandalf that. to <laughs> David Bowie. <laughs> um, yeah, thank, you. Yes, yes. thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I hope uh, we can uh, travel uh, uh, with you in the future. I'd be delighted if that's the, the case. It's, it's great to meet you all. Constanta, thank you so much for inviting me. Have a good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> thank, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.